words of power because we are kings and our words matter. The blood covenant made through the Lord Jesus Christ through his shed blood on the cross of Calvary tells me that Jesus will never ever leave me nor forsake me under any circumstances. I can go through the storm, I can go through the wind, I can go through the most difficult days in life. Jesus will never ever leave me. I say it ten times again and again, Jesus will never ever leave me. AFT Chennai welcomes you to its special New Year service on December 31st at 10 p.m. The service will be held at the Jesus Calls campus in Vanagaram, Chennai. The message will be in English with translation in Tamil. Everyone is welcome. We hope to see you there. Have a blessed New Year. In your moment of greatest crisis in your life and problems in your life, when you think you're in big trouble, that is when you need to remember that you are a covenant person, that God will not forget you, God will not leave you there. His mercies are new every morning, so tomorrow will be totally different from what is today. Today you may be a total failure. Tomorrow you will make it a great success. If you will submit yourself to God and turn to God and repent from your ways and give yourself to God, God will bless you and lift you and change you and give you victory in every situation. His mercy is new every morning. God can change things tomorrow for you. Every day, His mercy is new. The most wonderful illustration of this is of the Hesed is David's story. David committed that great sin with Bathsheba. You know the story, right? Took another man's wife. Not only did he take another man's wife, that other man was his soldier. David was the king. He was in the front lines fighting the battles for his king. He took his wife and told his commander to put him in the front line so that he can be killed. 
Connivingly, he brought about the death of that woman's husband so that he can have that woman permanently. Big sin, terrible. What is the punishment for the sin? According to the law of Moses, that person has to be stoned to death. The person who has done this must be stoned to death. In the law, there is no forgiveness. You must be stoned to death because you have caused another man to die. So what does David do? You know, he knows that if he goes to the law, he has no chance because the law will mete out to him punishment. And the punishment is death and it will all be over. So he goes beyond the law and appeals to God's mercy. Hesed. He says, have Hesed mercy upon me, O God. Psalm 51 verse 1. That is where he prays this prayer after he has sinned. He said, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of the tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. What a prayer. I love this, this prayer of David. He didn't come to say to God, Lord, I've done so much good, even though I've done this terrible thing, one bad. You know I killed Goliath. You know I had great faith. You know I did this and I did that. For that, where is my reward? He didn't come like that. He didn't come saying, Lord, I want justice. Do justice for me. Justice will be death. So he didn't appeal for justice. He says, have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness. I appeal to you to have mercy upon me. Not by the law book. Don't buy the, go by the Moses law book. I get killed. I appeal to you to show me mercy according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of, their ten, of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. What a prayer. I tell you, every person needs that prayer. Because none of us can ever come before God and say, Lord, bless me according to my goodness. I'm so good. I have been good. I've been good for the last two days, you know. Bless me, you know. <laughs> no, none of us can come to God like that. But we can all come to God saying, have mercy upon me, O God. Your mercy, that has it. That love, that unfailing love, the love that is steadfast, the love that never quits, that love that is strong. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. And uh, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Right? Amazing, amazing prayer. One of the best examples in the Bible illustrations of this is found in the book of Joshua in chapter 9 and 10. I don't want to read it because there's no time but I'll tell you the story quickly and uh, so that we can conclude. Joshua chapter 9 and 10. There, this, there is a story of the Gibeonites and Joshua making the covenant. When Joshua and his people went and possessed the promised land and took over they began to live there. There were already people living there, right? And God was displeased with those people that were living there because they were wicked people doing all kinds of evil things. God hated their lifestyle, the way they did things. So God said, do not have anything to do with them. Don't make any covenant with them whatsoever. Make sure you do not make any covenant with them. This is a warning that God gives in advance as they go and live there. Live there. When the time comes, when you don't need them, drive them out. Eh? Don't make any covenant with them. Don't link up yourself with them in any way. So they went there, and uh, all those people were afraid because they've heard about what happened to Jericho and the city of Ai and all that, you know, how God has blessed these people and the Red Sea and the miracles of God in the wilderness. And so all those people are afraid that, you know, God is with them and... Uh, and, and favorable to them and so on. So everybody wanted to make covenant with Joshua. 
and the Gibeonites were afraid because they were living nearby and uh, they wanted to make covenant to protect their life because they were afraid that Joshua one day is going to drive them out and take their land also, which was bound to happen. And they have heard also, if you read the story, they have heard, the Gibeonites have heard that God had told Joshua not to make any covenant with them. So how to go about making a covenant? Joshua will not make a covenant. So they said, we'll trick Joshua into making a covenant. So what they did was they selected some people, dressed them up with old clothes, with old, you know, shoes and so on, worn out, to make them look like they're coming from far away walking, dirtying their clothes and tearing up their shoes. They've been walking hundreds and hundreds of miles, you know. They wanted to make them look like that. And they gave them uh, wine bottles, uh, skin, wine skins that were cracked and so on. And uh, they gave them bread that was mildewed, you know, as if it was many days old. But they're just from nearby, they're their neighbors, you know. And they just came in that appearance and uh, went before Joshua and said, we come from a very far country. We need your help. We've heard about your wonderful God. We believe in your God also because he has done so many things and it's so wonderful. We want to join with you. We want to make a covenant with you and so on. And Joshua was tricked into making a covenant with them. Joshua could have inquired with God saying, should I do this or not? And God would have told him. Joshua failed to inquire and ask God's permission. He simply went ahead hurriedly and made a covenant with them. After he made the covenant with them and they left, he found out that these people were just people that are living right next to them. They have tricked them into making a covenant. Now they cannot touch them. They cannot kill them. They cannot drive them out. They cannot do anything wrong. They have to make them live there. What to do? Plus, when the Gibeonites went back to live in their place, five other kings that were living around them, five other communities which had kings, they were upset that this fellow has made a covenant with Joshua. So they came against Gibeon and fought against Gibeon to destroy Gibeon. And what Gibeon does is immediately he sends word to his covenant partner, Joshua. He says, hey, you are my covenant partner. Remember, we made covenant. So please come and help me because these fellows are trying to kill me. Five kings are coming up against me. Why don't you come and help me with your army? So Joshua was told by God, this is the most surprising thing, was told by God to go. God said, don't be afraid. No man will be able to stand against you. Go. Don't be afraid. I'll give them into your hands. In other words, even though those fellows came and tricked Joshua into a covenant, God was telling Joshua to honor the covenant and go and support them. Because it's a covenant, it cannot be violated. Whether it was done under trickery or, uh, uh, you know, otherwise. It doesn't matter. The covenant is a covenant. Once the covenant is made, it cannot be violated. Even though they have tricked and lied and done all these things, God says, you go and protect them. And Joshua went to battle and that is where he made the sun stand still and the moon stand still and all of that. God did big miracles. If God will make the sun stand still and moon stand still and do all these big miracles in order to honor a covenant made with a trickster, a liar, if God will so honor the covenant, make sure that covenant is honored because that covenant was a life-saving covenant. It was the main condition of the covenant was to save their lives. To save their lives, God made the sun and the moon to stop and did miracles. If God would do that, how much more God will honor the new covenant thought about by our Father God, executed by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. How much more will he honor it? I didn't make the covenant with him. My representative Jesus Christ as a man for me stood there and for all men, he was our representative, made the covenant. He does not lie. As a man, he was man's representative. As a God, he was God's representative. In one man, the new covenant was inaugurated through that one man. Will not God honor his covenant? 
I'll tell you, if you'll honor the covenant made by a trickster so much, God will honor the new covenant made by Jesus Christ much more, thousand times more sure, my friend. That is why the New Testament promises are so dear to us that all the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. Even if heaven and earth passes away, his word will not pass away. God says, even as the mountains be removed, my covenant will stand, he says in Isaiah 54. Even if mountains are removed, my covenant will stand. What a wonderful thing to think about. Covenant is unshaken. It's steadfast. Covenant love is strong, unshaken. Mountains may shatter and become like powder, but not God's love for us because it is based on the blood covenant that was executed on the cross of Calvary. That is why every month when you come and lift up that cup and say this is the blood of the new covenant, we are reminding ourselves of who we are, where we stand and what we possess, that we are a covenant people. We cannot be shaken because God's steadfast love is upon us. God will honor his every promise for us because it is covenant promises. It is not just ordinary word of mouth promises. It is promises made by the blood of Jesus Christ on the basis of the blood of Jesus Christ. That is why we are told to observe the communion all the time, to remind ourselves. Our faith should grow as we take the communion because it should remind us of the covenant and what it means that it cannot fail, God cannot lie, God cannot keep from doing it. Just like God gave 100-year-old man a child, God will do anything for me. Whatever he has promised, he'll do. It doesn't matter how long it takes, it doesn't matter how long, how, how hard it is, how big it is, God will do it. Amen? Amen? Finally, let me take you to Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 5, the later portion of verse 5. You remember that wonderful promise that God gave to Joshua that the writer of the Hebrews refers to here. This is one of my favorite pro promises from the Bible. I've preached on many occasions in different ways this one verse. I love to preach on this verse. But look at this, without covenant, without understanding the covenant, you really hardly ever understand that. Verse 5 says, he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. For he has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's the simple English translation. But let me read it to you in the Amplified Version. Look at the Amplified Version. It will come alive. For he, God himself, has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not leave you helpless. In, and uh, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake, nor let you down, or relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. Now, the repetitions of I will not, I will not, I will not is not something that I put. Amplified version translates it like this. Let me read it to you again. Make sure you understand that. Yeah? It's not like I forgot that I read I will not. And then, you know. For he himself or God himself has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake, nor let you down or relax my hold on you, assuredly not. Why did God give a promise like that to Joshua? This promise actually originally was given to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1 verse 5. It was a covenant promise. Why would not God leave 
the Israelites alone? Why wouldn't, why would he forgive them again and again? Why would he be merciful to them and gracious to them, even in the midst of their rebellion? Why would he reach out to them and be kind to them, even in the midst of all their sin and all of that? Why so, so much kindness? Why so much graciousness? Because of the covenant. Because the covenant makes him act like that. He has made the covenant, he has promised it, and he must do it, and he's somehow trying to do it even in spite of their failure to keep the terms and so on. But the thing is this, in the English language, in translation, they've simply translated as, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But actually, what the Hebrew language says, or what the Greek says, if you really want to translate it, and really say it the way it says. It needs five negatives to really say it. I will not, I will not, I will not, I will not, I will not ever leave you, nor forsake you. Five times. Why? That I will not is so sure. It is so, so sure. How to make you know it is so sure? If you said it one time, you don't think it's so sure. So five times he says, I will not, I will not, I will not, I will not, I will not. Five times. Five negatives in order to express what kind of covenant love this love is. What kind of love this is. That God will under no circumstances leave you. Now when we were little in Sunday school, we used to sing a song in Tamil. Yesu ennai kaivida matar. In English also it's there. He will never let go of my hand. He will never let go of my hand. He will never let go of my hand. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow. Something like that. He will never let go of my hand. After we sang it, we'll st stand outside and talk about how God has forsaken us. You know. <laughs> because, you know, really... <laughs> I've been in that, that's why I'm telling you. We did everything so fast. We went in express f speed, you know. From the time the service started, it was highly charged. And we went, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Finished. You know, look, go. You know, that's the way it was. And when, when it's going, it's good. But after it's gone, you know, you're like zapped. <laughs> And you ask the people, what did you learn? They say, I don't know what I learned, you know. But it felt good. It sure did feel good. And we really meant it. And we liked that feeling good. But then uh, when I started to understand these truths, I began to stop and think about the covenant. And I began to think about these promises. And the simple song, what a wonderful song. Somebody with a great revelation has written it. Has so much in it. He will never let go of my hand. He will never leave me, nor forsake me. Sometimes people say, in those days I used to sing those three, four line choruses ten times again and again. So one fellow came and asked me, do you have to sing it this, that many times? Because he comes from a church where they sing the first verse and the last verse, you know. <laughs> because they are in a hurry to go home. So, he says, do you have to sing it, sing those four lines ten times? I said, uh, after ten times, did it ever get into you? I promise you, if it gets into you well, then I'll stop singing it, you know. I'm singing it so many times because I need it. If I sang it ten times, it sinks into me. So many times in the time of my trouble, in the time of my greatest need and problem, I lift up my eyes before God and I say, Jesus will never let go of my hand. Jesus will never forsake me nor leave me. And many times I say it more than five times. More than five times. I thank you, Lord, because you have said, you will never leave me, nor forsake me. You will never leave me, nor forsake me. You will not leave me, nor forsake me. You will not leave me, nor forsake me. You will not leave me, nor forsake me. Oh, to this hard head, it takes at least five times to get it in. You will never leave me, nor forsake me. And I say to you, no matter what your problem is, 
no matter where you stand, no matter who you are, no matter what condition you are in, doesn't matter. God will never leave you nor forsake you. That's what the covenant guarantees. <laughs> the blood covenant made through the Lord Jesus Christ, through his shed blood on the cross of Calvary, tells me that Jesus will never ever leave me nor forsake me under any circumstances. I can go through the storm, I can go through the wind, I can go through the most difficult days in life, Jesus will never, ever leave me. I say it 10 times again and again, Jesus will never, ever leave me. And I say that to you today. And let those words be in your mouth. Jesus will never, ever leave me. Never leave me, nor forsake me. Never leave me, nor forsake me. He will never leave me, nor forsake me. He will never leave me, nor forsake me. That is the truth. That's the covenant. The covenant guarantee takes five negatives to be expressed that he will never leave nor forsake. Our God is good, our God is great, our God is true. There is nothing in this world he cannot do. His mighty hands were made available to you. Oh, praise his name, he's on the other side of faith. Our God is good, our God is great, our God is true. There is nothing in this world he cannot do. His mighty hands were made available to you. Oh, praise his name, he's on the other side of faith. Keep pressing on, keep pressing on. Pressing on, keep pressing on. God's on the other side of the And though the clouds may for a moment hide his face, remember God is on the other side of the Threatening clouds may hide your vision for a while and you may wonder if he hears you when you pray but don't forget that god is love and you're his child press on in faith because the answer's on the way